Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to meet you for the last session of Open Education Global uh, that takes place only online this year again, but it's uh, really nice uh, to see so many people from all around the world, from Peru, for example, and from Vancouver and from California. Uh, I myself, uh, I am in the north of France and uh, and it's uh, from South Africa to uh, Yako, so it's great. So first of all, for this last session, I wanted to celebrate the award that we, uh, the speaker all had. So this is a small coupe of champagne, what we drink in France to celebrate such events. And I thought it was appropriate to this last session. Hello, James. <laughs> So uh, I'm really happy. I was a speaker myself, and uh, we can really uh, all congratulate yourself of having been awarded uh, with a special award uh, that uh, is that we are all a uh, speaker for open education resources and open education all around the world, and therefore in line with the UNESCO recommendation. So this is really nice. <laughs> I should drink. <laughs> Good. Um, I am Perrine, Perrine de Quatlogon. So you can say Perrine if, you, if it's too difficult, it's more easy. I am a member of the board of Open Education Global. And uh, I am welcoming you on this uh, last uh, recommendation for cooperation, international cooperation to implement the OER recommendation, building capacity and developing supporting policies. Um, I am um, also interested by the thematics of micro, micro credentialing uh, because I am uh, not only working on open education within my University of Lille, but I am also an expert for blockchain and education, hosting a national working group and now being the French representative within the European Blockchain Partnership. So this has to do with uh, uh, micro-credentialing, and uh, I could uh, say a few words at the end. I'm really very interested to hear from you all, and I am uh, very glad to begin with uh, Nicole and uh, Melissa Guadalupe and Vasanti Adjono. Please go on. I leave you the floor. Thank you. I'm going to, just going to share my screen really quickly. All right. Can we see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Great. Hello, Hello. Alan. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Saad and I lead the education team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And Melissa? Oh, hi everyone, I'm Melissa. I'm part of the education team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And you'll also hear in this presentation from our colleague, Pasanti Hariono, who because of the time zone conflict couldn't join us today. Great, thanks Melissa. So thank you everyone for having us today. We're here to talk to you about reading Wikipedia in the classroom. I'm sure most of you, hopefully all of you have heard of Wikipedia. Uh, we at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, we're the nonprofit that supports Wikipedia and other free knowledge projects. Wikipedia can be considered the largest OER in the world with the largest repository of human knowledge let's say ever co-created with a community of volunteers all around the world. The Wikimedia Foundation supports the, the free knowledge projects and we support the community of volunteers. And today we're here to talk to you about, about the foundation's flagship teacher training program, Reading Wikipedia in the Classroom. This teacher training program was first piloted in 2020 in Bolivia, Morocco, and the Philippines. Before reading Wikipedia, we had often heard from teachers, parents, and students that Wikipedia was not allowed to be used in the classroom. Um, this was such a common trope that we thought uh, we, we better do something to help defeat the misconceptions and actually 
be proactive in helping teachers understand the true educational value of this platform. Research even confirmed that though teachers often use Wikipedia for their own lesson planning, they wouldn't allow their students to use it out of fear of misinformation, fear of misuse. So reading Wikipedia aimed to shift the dialogue around Wikipedia and education toward one that recognizes its value as a tool for teaching media and information literacy, helping students to think critically, not only about information on Wikipedia, but about all information that they consume. And we did this alongside our community. So the Wikimedia movement is a community of volunteers from all over the world. And as the education team, it's really important for us to, to help the community to be able to, to implement these types of initiatives in their localities. And it's also really important for us to ensure that anything that we produce is adaptable and localizable to local education systems. So in order to make this program as adaptable and localizable as possible, we aimed to implement it in countries with very diverse cultures, languages, and education systems. So we worked alongside our affiliates and communities in three countries, Morocco, Bolivia, and the Philippines, and we hired local coordinators in each of those countries that supported the project from the beginning initial needs assessment stage to creating the curriculum, um, drafting the documents, all the way to the end in doing the evaluation research. We did this together. Each country's program looked very different and working in this way helped to support our goal of ensuring that reading Wikipedia was adaptable. It also helped to build these communities capacity to work in the education sector. And because we wanted it to be as meaningful to teachers as possible, we decided to use the uh, main components of UNESCO's Media and Information Literacy Framework to align our curriculum. And we included localized examples, um, example references to local policies and linked concepts that we learned that the teachers were interested in through an initial needs assessment. In that initial needs assessment, we interviewed and we surveyed uh, hundreds of teachers in these three countries uh, to learn about their initial perspectives about Wikipedia and also about the challenges that they were facing with their students when it came to uh, accessing and evaluating information online. So we designed this curriculum uh, with three parts, three modules, and each module is connected to these three main components of UNESCO's Media Information Literacy Framework. The first module is around accessing information, the second one around evaluating information, and the third one about creating information. Um, so we included in each of these modules exploratory activities for the teachers to come closer and engage with Wikipedia from a more critical point of view. And we included within all of these linked concepts uh, also a section about OERs. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so one of the sections that we included in the curriculum was around open and OERs including Wikipedia. So we asked teachers to look at Wikipedia as an OER, a curriculum aimed to help teachers understand not only Wikipedia, but also other open movements. The reflection questions help teachers reflect on the resources that they use in their classroom and whether or not they would be able to incorporate more OERs. So many of the teachers that responded to these questions said that they didn't really use OERs, that they preferred to use textbooks, um, that textbooks were the primary, government provided textbooks were the primary resources that they used. But I'd like to highlight the response of one teacher who shared, I usually use books in the classroom, in the classroom not because I am the traditional way of teaching my learners, but due to poor internet connection in school. But given the chance to have a strong internet connectivity, I'd rather use the OER. Why? It can really give um, my learners a better experience. It has high quality and offers flexibility. So you can see that some teachers really didn't understand what OER were, and some teachers had you know, some kind of understanding, and some teachers identified uh, a lot of barriers to using OER. So we hoped that through this curriculum, it would at least raise awareness to what this was how they could incorporate it into their classroom in addition 
to whatever resources that they were already provided. Um, and we saw that it did that. And in the pilot, uh, we uh, shared this curriculum with the teachers through three through these three modules in the form of teachers guides that were available through a PDF. But uh, in order for to make this a really you know professional development opportunity for the teachers, we needed a spaces where we could connect uh, see both synchronously and asynchronously. So as part of the of this training program, we incorporated synchronous training sessions that were led by our local coordinators, and they were of course aligned with the curriculum in the teacher's guides. Uh, you can see there an example of a training session that we conducted in Bolivia that shows the agenda for the day. And then we have another image uh, about, if you go to the next, Nicole, uh, that's what the training session looked like for the teachers in Morocco, also led by our local coordinators. And this was done through uh, private Zoom rooms uh, in five different locations. Uh, we, for each module, we had two, two synchronous training sessions of about an hour and a half. And it was an opportunity as well for teachers to uh, get their questions answered, to, for the coordinators to propose new activities and to provide further guidance as they move through the curriculum. In the case of the Philippines, which you can see in the next slide, uh, we actually had a partnership with the Department of Education in Pasay City, and we were able to um, broadcast these trainings, these synchronous training sessions through the Department of Education's Facebook page. And thanks to that, we reached thousands of teachers that got, con that got online Sync to the, this, this webinar and participated through the chat very, very actively. We we're also very lucky to have uh, Wikimedians from all over the world that were online at that time jump into the chat and help answer uh, some questions that the teachers were leaving as the local coordinators were providing the, the training. Um, but that was one element. Another element uh, for asynchronous communication that we used uh, was the Facebook groups. And we decided to create these uh, asynchronous communication spaces on Facebook because through our needs assessment, we learned that teachers were already using Facebook a lot for uh, the new online trainings, for uh, online communities of practice, that they were getting more and more involved in the face of the school closures that, uh, from last year. So we created these three uh, learning private private learning groups for each of the countries, and in these uh, Facebook groups, the teachers could see uh, basically the same structure of the curriculum in the teachers' guides, and they had spaces to share the responses to each of these reflection and practical activities. This was also a way for the local coordinators to track the teachers' progress. Uh, start identifying some trends, some common questions that they could bring into the synchronous training sessions and then share with everybody else. Um, and this was a really good um, platform for a lot of teachers, but some teachers didn't really like it. So this was also, this also helped us learn what were some of the elements of these, uh, of using the Facebook groups that really engaged the teachers and what were some of the areas of improvement for the next iterations of the program. And now uh, to kind of get more into what the thinking about what we learned from this uh, first pilot experience, uh, we're going to play a video that was recorded by my colleague Fasanti Haryono. She was in charge of leading the evaluation stage of this pilot, and she will share a little bit more of what is it that we found and what is it that we learned from this experience. So Nicole, I think you have to unmute so that we can hear the sound. Hello everyone, uh, I would like to share some of the results that we found uh, through our post-program um, evaluation of the Reading Wikipedia in the classroom. Uh, so yeah, um, we produce... Uh, Sorry. Hello everyone, uh, I would like to share some of the results that we found uh, through our post-program um, evaluation of the Reading Wikipedia in the classroom. Uh, so yeah, um, we produce uh, teacher's guides containing three modules and associated training assets, which were all translated into four languages uh, through their implementation in three countries, the Philippines, Morocco, and Bolivia. And more than 7,000 teachers were rich. Um, 580 participated in the full training program and 169 uh, teachers earned a certificate 
And um, yeah, overall teachers' perception changed and they became more interested in contributing to Wikipedia. And uh, affiliates develop skills uh, to work in the education sectors. Our affiliate partners, uh, affiliate partners uh, also express readiness to implement the next chapter of the program in the countries. And for the jump of readership uh, in the Philippines, which I will show you the graph uh, in the next slide. So average weekly views before the training, it was around 28 million. And after our first training event, the weekly views jumped to 58 million. So that was like a 30 million uh, plus jump uh, of Wikipedia readership. And yeah, this is the graph uh, of the readership. Uh, so over, as you can see, over the past several years, Wikipedia readership trends in the Philippines have remained steady. We can see a significant spike at the beginning of the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, and the opening ceremony for reading Wikipedia in the classroom took place on September 22nd. And on average, uh, each virtual engagement hosted by the Department of Education received around 5,600 views with 22,400 uh, total views and uh, 600 teachers were enrolled in the training program which lasted until the closing ceremony on December 11th. And uh, during that time of implementation, we can see a significant spike in page views per day. Uh, additionally, we can see that this increase is sustained after the program finished as the average page views is constantly higher than any time before the training program um, implementation. So going forward, we'll be exploring how this training program impacts readership when we have a large scale partnership with an education system, as we look to understand uh, what factors contributed uh, the most to the increase in page views. Um, so yeah, this training program was conducted uh, in the Philippines, particularly um, just conducted just before the school year started uh, during the pandemic. So it was delayed for some time um, due to the in inadequate amount of online teaching resources. And by the end of the program, we found that teachers' perspectives and trust towards the use of open education resources as a source of information become more positive. And again, as we piloted the training uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a demand for online teaching resources. And we saw the increase in readership and the overall improvement of teachers' perception on Wikipedia in the Philippines shows how teachers become more open-minded to various online resources that are readily available. Um, so yeah, we also measure the teachers' increased skills in changing and changing perspectives. Um, one of the outcomes uh, that the training program achieved was the changing perspectives of teachers in the use of Wikipedia in education. So before the program implementation, many teachers were still doubting whether Wikipedia is a valuable source of information to be incorporated into their teaching resources in their classroom. And by the end of the program, no more teachers doubt Wikipedia as a valuable uh, source of information and they believe that teachers should use Wikipedia in their classroom. And this, uh, you can see on the screen, is one of the best uh, final assignments from the teacher participants. Uh, we know that teachers were able to uh, apply the skills they learn uh, to their teaching practice because the final assignment we gave them asked them to create a lesson plan incorporating the media and information literacy framework um, and Wikipedia. And teachers also found that uh, the program helped them navigate information on Wikipedia better. And the module helps them to use Wikipedia in the classroom with students by organizing activities to learn about new topics and improve their knowledge and research online. Uh, from the post-program interview, we also found that uh, the program provided professional and continuous support while providing an online co-learning environment that allowed teachers to uh, value Wikipedia as a pedagogical tool for developing media and information literacy skills. And based on the post-program evaluation also, we, teacher, we found that teachers were happy with the training program delivery. It contributed to their effort uh, to implement virtual learning to their students as well. And teachers said that they, they liked the way the module's uh, questions were publicly shared on Facebook group. Um, and that other teachers also have to answer them publicly uh, on the group. That way teachers felt like they also learned a lot from other teachers' perspectives and answers. And um, the in terms of building capacity of our affiliates partners, um, we found that local coordinators and affiliates reported increased skills to carry the following activities. 
And uh, we learned that affiliates identify three main impacts in their capacity. The first being uh, increased awareness of possible models for Wikipedia and education programs and capacity needed for their implementation. And then the second impact is increased capacity to establish uh, partnerships and networks within the academic sector. And the third impact was uh, the increased desire to promote uh, more involvement opportunities with the education sector and actors uh, such as teachers to join the local Wikimedia community and user group. I'm going to hand over um, the mic to Nicole uh, to talk more about how this program is evolving after its first edition in the three countries. Thank you. Thanks, Voss. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to let Melissa talk about how we are scaling this program through a training of trainers. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, so our next steps into scaling this program, uh, one of the, the next steps is certifying new local uh, facilitators, local coordinators, to implement this program in a way that is, again, meaningful, significant, pertinent to the teachers in their own localities. And through that, we hope to build a network of certified facilitators uh, who can continue expanding this and adapting this, this program. Uh, so starting actually next Friday, we are uh, starting a training of trainers, uh, an online training of trainers for 25, 26 people uh, from about 20 countries around the world who in the next eight weeks will get a deep dive into the building blocks of this program. They will learn about the teacher's uh, side of the experience, how to facilitate this, uh, this, this process, this program, and how to uh, create basically a project management plan in order to uh, find local partnerships and, and continue scaling as well. Uh, so we're very excited about this next stage, and this will also include a little bit of funding communities and reuse of assets that Nicole will, will talk about before we run out of time. I, I know that we're very, very close to, to the 20 minutes mark. We are very, we're almost done. Um, so just to mention that this first cohort of 26 is the first of many that we will be um, facilitating over the next year and years to come. So for anyone listening who might be interested in becoming a certified facilitator of reading Wikipedia in the classroom, you can stay tuned. We will have further opportunities um, to complete the training of trainers. And those who complete the training of trainers have access to funding opportunities. Um, so we will be uh, allowing those who uh, complete the certification to apply for grants. And we have uh, grants that are specific for reading Wikipedia in the classroom at the Wikimedia Foundation. And we're also supporting partners, for example, the British Council, who will be reusing the um, training assets of reading Wikipedia to implement in their own programs. Um, and all of the uh, assets that we created for reading Wikipedia in the classroom are under open licenses and are free for reuse. And with that, we'll say thank you. I don't know why I cannot move to the next one. Um, well, then, yes. Maybe there Great are question. two minutes, no, even more. We can take, uh, in any case, uh, yes, 10 minutes, not more, but 10 minutes will be all right for questions. So well done, it's fantastic. Uh, I uh, wrote already in the chat uh, commenting. I think uh, you were ready when the lockdown happened and, and this your figures are amazing. Uh, and this is a uh, typical for open education community uh, to have understood that it has a, a virtuous way to to make it happen, <laughs> sharing and, and and learning and teaching uh, teaching the teachers how to use Wikipedia is a great idea. Uh, who has a, a question, Alan? Maybe no. Okay. I saw you, so I thought you had a question. Oh, Perrine, actually, to your comment, uh, to, to your very kind comment, we were originally, when we were planning this program, we were planning it as an in-person uh, training, professional development program. And then COVID happened, and we just quickly had to pivot and, uh, yeah, rethink the whole implementation of the program from, uh, you know, an online uh, modality. So it was a very interesting experience for us, uh, just yes. making that, yeah. that change. You reach That's true. Much Sometimes more. we forget. <laughs> of course, and it was very innovative, and you are ready to take it. 
And so you reached many more people than uh, expected, actually. Yeah, definitely. I will just add, though, that, for example, in the Philippines, we had the partnership with the Ministry of Education, and that really helped with the reach. Um, in Morocco, as a kind of contradictory example, it's a culture that really kind of relies on in-person um, events and communication. And because of that, like need to, you know, for example, go to the ministry and meet with someone in order to like really build that relationship, we were able to have the same kind of partnership that we had in the Philippines. Um, and the, the community there still really believes that an in-person edition of the training will be the most impactful. So when it's calmer, they, they intend to go back to kind of in-person training. Yeah, and, and to complement that, in the, in the case of Bolivia, uh, the community there already has taken ownership of the program, and they have, they are in the final weeks of implementing a second edition of, of the same program, and actually an even more uh, localized version with uh, assets that, uh, that have a visual identity that is closer to the Bolivian reality. Uh, they are looking into translating it to more languages from Bolivia. Uh, so, so yeah, so they are basically uh, completely independent in implementing this program uh, and they will, they plan on doing it as a, as a very important aspect of their education programming as a Wikimedia affiliate. I will always remember the first time I was in Warsaw for the, the uh, Open Education Policy Forum uh, organized by Alec Tarkovsky, that's maybe four years ago. and, and uh, the, a lot of people from East, Eastern country were there and uh, uh, Biela uh, Russia said uh, to us, Wikipedia is our only source of OER and the only way we can create and produce and share. And in the language, because it's the, not so many people uh, speak Belarus and uh, this is why uh, it's, it's complicated. Uh, Sometimes for French people to say, yes, we are the Francophone community, but we don't see how many languages for how many people it's hard to, to have good OER, good uh, educational content, even private, in their own language. So learning and teaching with Wikipedia is a great tool, I think. Well, and thank you for the details. Thank you very much. And uh, we will leave the floor to the next one. Thank you so much. Hello. Well, yes, yeah, hello. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> Hi, Nina. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to meet you, Verona. Uh, so where are you from? I am from... Um, well, originally Alberta in Canada, but I am now out of uh, Montreal, Montreal, oh, Canada. All right. So. And my colleagues, Ma Dr. Michelle Jacobson and Nicole Nutzling, are also here to present while I get the screen share going. Thank you Hi, very everyone. much. It's great yeah. to see everyone. I'm logging in from Calgary. And Nicole, where are you logging in from? I'm in, logging in from Golden, Golden, BC. So we're in three different provinces in Canada right now. This is so exciting. <laughs> that, that's actually how our, our group has worked remotely the entire time. But, yes, um, we have never so, actually met face to face together, this group. This is so impressive when you finally meet a, a day you will. And it happened to me uh, in the early September to meet a lot of people I've been working in the light eight, last 18 months. And it's really something special. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great and it's possible to work online for years, but it's nice to meet also. Uh, so you will be presenting about open education co-design as a participatory pedagogy in an online graduate class. Please, I leave you the floor. I just found great. out that you're not seeing the right screen. Mm -hmm. I we got to imagine. see your email though. Yeah, I was gonna say, it should be very exciting. Let's try again. Thank you for telling me that. Was that in the thousands that I saw in your inbox? Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, Michelle, don't. Okay, this time am I right? 
Yeah. Can you see? Okay. You're okay. Right. You're good. My apologies. Let's start again. Um, I was so delighted to hear the presentation before because I am um, an instructor or a sessional instructor, an adjunct assistant professor with the University of Calgary. And I use Wikipedia in my classes and I support my uh, pre service teachers, which are teachers before they become teachers or certified teachers in Alberta. Um, and, and I might not be in the millions, but I felt I was participating in part of your project. Um, today, we are going to be presenting on open education co-design as a participatory pedagogy in an online graduate class. And we, as I've introduced, uh, we have three of our team with us today. And one of them was a student in the class that I taught. So I was the uh, instructor. And then um, actually Dr. Michelle Jacobson was, um, um, my supervisor for my um, doctoral work, but now, now she's a colleague since I successfully <laughs> passed. But it's really important for everyone to know before we start the connections and the interconnections for this project itself. So Michelle. And I know everyone's coming in uh, to this session from different places in the world, but um, given our connection to the University of Calgary, the three of us wish to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pakani, and Gainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda to the northwest of Calgary, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And we encourage you to put your, your land acknowledgements in the chat as you wish um, to acknowledge the many places that you're joining us from. Thank you, Michelle. Nicole? Yeah, I'll introduce the, the team. So it is quite a diverse team made up of, we've got faculty, professors, librarians, and some students. Um, a couple of us are not here today, but, but Mia, for example, was an undergraduate student who was working on this. I was a graduate student. Uh, Christy Hurl is the librarian at the USC, and then our lovely professors and research team, um, Dr. Barb Brown, who can't be with us today, and Dr. Verena Roberts and Dr. Michelle Jacobson, who are both here and leading the way. So again, it's kind of interesting, but we have not met in person. So this has always been an online, remote, virtual project, which is quite fascinating. And the students that we're going to be talking about, the students and the instructors, they were bound together um, in the Leading and Learning in a Digital Age program. Um, this is a four course graduate certificate that's stackable towards a Master of Education degree. So the students start with a course in the summer on interdisciplinary learning and technology. They, do, they take a course in the fall. We're primarily focusing on work that was um, really amplified in the third course, which is ethics and educational technology. And then they complete their coursework in the spring. The work on this project though extended beyond the end of the course um, for several more months as the students who chose to uh, continue the um, development of the OER continued to collaborate with us and work on their chapters uh, and go through several rounds of peer review in the next couple of months following their graduate certificate. So um, there's more about that on the website and I can pop the link in the chat window to find out a bit more about that four course certificate. It was such a privilege for me to teach the first course in that certificate this summer with 26 students who are on their journey, um, like the one that Nicole finished a couple of years ago. So we're just going to start off to ensure that we have a common context of the terms that we're going to be using in this presentation. In our context, open educational resources are connected to the UNESCO recommendations and specifically their teaching and learning resources in any medium, digital or otherwise, that permit no cost access, use, reuse, and repurposing by others. And then we decided to use Cronin's definition of open educational practices from 2017, which which highlights the collaborative practices with that include the use of OER, but really also focusing on the participatory technologies and social networks for interaction, um, peer learning and knowledge creation and empowerment of learners. They are just as important to us as 
the use and, and, and creation of OER. So with the research, we were really interested in the student uh, interactions with each other, with expertise within and beyond the course, um, with the instructors and with the research team. We really wanted to understand both the design process um, and then also evaluate the impact um, of this learning experience and the production of OER on their engagement and their learning. Um, so the research question is there. We did um, a number of interviews. So a graduate student did the interviews and anonymized them before the research team got to work with them. We also surveyed students. Um, and um, we also had, of course, access to the artifacts they produced. And I've put a link to that in the window. So we really wanted to explore the open learning design that came out of Verena's doctoral research um, and was amplified in this design process. So the four interconnected parts of that open learning design framework are clarifying the co-design process and negotiating each learner's personalized learning pathway, building and sharing knowledge. Um, we supported learners in choosing how to communicate their learning and uh, how and when to make their learning and thinking visible. The third part is building learning relationships. And again, it's not just that learning relationship between the instructor and the students, but putting intentional scaffolds and supports in place to support students learning with each other and also connecting with others who could help them beyond the classroom. And then finally, sustaining the learning beyond the course and the writing process. I've kind of hinted at that and how the student learning extended across four courses in a graduate certificate, as well as extended beyond um, the end of the certificate itself. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how we moved through this course. So we started out, it was a course on ethics and educational technology. So I was able to pick an area within that genre that I was interested in. So I picked 3D printing. It was something I had access to at my school and I was really fascinated and wanted to dig into. Um, so we picked that and I had to create a digital outline to start with. And I used um, Pharaoh's ethical framework to frame my chapter more or less. Then we moved into a one minute chapter pitch. So we had to record a little bit of an elevator speech about what our, our chapter was going to be about. Constructed a draft chapter that when it went out for external and internal feedback. And so what we mean by that is I had a little cohort or pod of other students within the course that I shared my draft with and they gave me feedback. And then I took my draft and I had to send it out to people outside of the university kind of bubble community. Um, and they took another look at it and gave me more and more feedback. And so we had various drafts. Then it went into its final draft, kind of final draft that got submitted. And I got to decide whether I wanted to include that in the open uh, press book or I had the choice to not include it if I didn't want to. I did want to include it so that it went through another round of feedback and um, we had professors go in and really dig into whether I had cited everything properly. And we took a look at Creative Commons licensing and how to handle that. And then at the end, I ended up with a piece of work published in an OER, which is pretty cool. Now the book, the first version of the book is called Ethical Use in Technology and Digital Learning Environments. And we're going to post the link in the chat group. Um, but what's really important here is although the research team and the instructor and the, the program director all uh, work together for the introductory chapter, the, the book itself, this press book, is actually written by the students, and they have a deeper appreciation of OER, open learning, and open education as a result of their participation and creation. <laughs> so I'm just going to show you a quick overview of the actual open learning framework or open learning design framework. And Nicole highlighted some of the key parts there, but this is where it connected back to my dissertation work. But what we, she didn't actually mention it entirely was the importance of reflection in this whole process. Because 
Um, while I say or encourage the students uh, to be engaged and motivated and participate as much as possible, unless they took that time to be really reflective of their own learning and think about what they were learning, how they were learning, who they were sharing with, why they would want to share something with someone else, and the, the gift really of feedback from others um, and, and actually acting upon that feedback within their learning process, um, this actually wouldn't have been as successful as it was. So you'll see that reflection is a key part as uh, Michelle did highlight right at the beginning in this whole framework, but the internal and external feedback helps to co-design and we use co-design rather than co-create when we're talking about um, the uh, learning in itself because we really focus on that uh, knowledge building theory um, rather than um, more of a cognitive co-create type theoretical approach. So the language usage is, is we're, we're trying to transition more to the idea that this is uh, learning that is designed with, uh, with students, between students and the instructor rather than just the instructor at the beginning. You'll see the co-design happening reflection and these uh, iterative loops that happen over and over again. And the description that you've offered, Karina, is so important. Those iterative generative loops that are part of the learning process, but were also a part of our research approach. So we did use a design-based research approach um, through multiple cycles of analyzing, feeding forward what we were learning into the next week of the course, into the next stage of the research, into the types of feedback that we provided for students. And we, capture here a few quotes from the students, from the transcripts of interviews with them, um, how they um, you know, experienced this course, which was probably twice the work than, the, than they expected. <laughs> and it kept going after the end of the certificate. So kudos to the students for persisting and enduring through the process. Um, you know, one comment from, the, from uh, the person identified as student three here, I would describe it as you, the student, have a say in what you learn and what you experience. Um, so the learning is more personalized. So really capturing that aspect of the learning experience. Student five told us it's a collaborative approach that involves students, teachers, potentially developers in the sense of the chapter. There are other individuals obviously helping refine the chapter work that we are all involved in. And that to me really captures what uh, uh, Scardamalia and Bereiter talk about with regards to knowledge building in community, that you know, people lean in on each other's work, they give feedback, they ask questions, they you know, probe for clarity and understanding and how the student has expressed themselves. In another comment um, from student one, I was able to connect with some people I know who share some of my research and educational research, educational uh, interests, the external feedback is what helped me chap, uh, shape my chapter ultimately. So going beyond, um, you know, valuing the instructor feedback, valuing the peer feedback, but also encouraging students to expand their personal and academic networks in their writing and sharing their writing and getting feedback. And then finally, I think co-designing learning is a collaborative between a student instructor and even the community. You have voice in it but it's structured. So capturing that liminal space between um, course-based credit bearing learning experiences and then also um, the uh, value of impact that can come beyond from beyond that course. So I'm gonna pop a video in the um, chat and pass the slides over to Nicole. I had both my name and Verena's on this, but I'll, I'll go into the ripple effects. So I think <laughs> as a, a graduate student and even in my undergraduate degree, I'd never worked on something that went out into the world. And I think that was very impactful for me and has been definitely a, a bit of a ripple effect. So it started off giving me the opportunity to publish a piece of my writing and, and by publish, I mean, putting it out into the open, which in other courses, again, most of my stuff sits in my Google Drive and collects dust and rots away. So this was very different and very authentic. And I think I worked a hundred times harder than I ever have before because of that. 
But then through that, it's enabled me to apply for an OER fellowship and continue the research going. So my capstone project, I, I then through the um, Hewlett Foundation was able to be funded to keep digging into this whole open movement and understanding it. Um, and then that's bled into to other things. So I've been able to gain experience attending conferences or even here where I get the chance to present and connect with the external community, especially the open community and get more involved. And it's also allowed me, we've moved it into a podcasting project. So it's just the project that never ends. So it started off as one assignment in one course, but it's turned into, well, really a, a big research focus for me and really a lot of other projects and I'm continuing to learn and it's been I think over a year now a year and a half since I, I wrote that chapter and I'm still involved and I've never ever had that in any other course and so I think co-creating and co-designing OER can be very very powerful from as a student. So bringing things back to the UNESCO recommendation and what we're talking about in this conference, um, the idea of building capacity of stakeholders to create, access, reuse, and redistribute OER is essential in multiple ways. And we heard about it in, in international ways before in, in the previous um, presentation. But for this presentation, this project itself, it was initiated because I'd had a conversation with someone at my university, not my supervisor before she asked, <laughs> um, um, and and I was basically told that was my idea. That was something in in my world, in my head. And I I was really struggling with how to share and build awareness about the wonderful things happening, as we've learned in OER around the world. So it made me think of an elder um, who who used to come to my my child's school, and he talked about the ripple effect, which is what Nicole, Nicole mentioned earlier. And the ripple effect is really about the idea that, like like seeds thrown upon the grass, some will some will grow and and some won't. And like a storm, the rain will come, and some some will have impact on some things, and some will have impact on others. But for this project in itself, although we might not be international yet, I just want to highlight that these are some of the ripple effects that have happened, and these aren't all the all of them that have been listed. So it might have started as an initial activity of the press book, but it changed into a blog and, and some work with Nicole in another iteration of the course this year. It changed to multiple presentations across our own university, like the Talon Network and beyond. Um, SOTL research that we're working on, connections with Otessa um, and future publications, Open Ed Fellow fellowships, uh, conference keynotes, writing, GoGN fellowships, as Nicole mentioned, and, and open webinars that we will be hosting, um, which is really exciting at the University of Calgary that are open to everyone that we will will add in um, the chat as well. So the idea of the ripple effect isn't quite like the butter butterfly effect that, that Wheatley talks about at all, that whatever you do will impact someone else on the, on the other side of, of the world and, and talking about complexity, but it's connected in that if you really believe deep down that everything in the earth and uh, has a connection, um, it's how does it connect and 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 there will be some kind of impact or or um, action at some point. Um, I'll just keep going. So some of the ingredients for success for a project like this. The infrastructure is essential. So access to press books, for, like through your institution or your region, we were lucky to have the University of Alberta support us with press books. You can always create your own press book yourself, of course, but the instance of the press book is really important in order to um, support your students, especially if they're going in and making the edits and doing some of the formatting themselves. I also really want to highlight the team effort. Being alone at the beginning in that moment was an isolating and experience. And I think many people in this uh, webinar itself have 
have felt isolated when talking about open, but the way for open to really um, expand and when we consider that ripple effect is to work in a team. So by considering those open educational practices and first connecting with my students and realizing the students are such an essential um, and important aspect to, to open learning, digital open, uh, digital authoring tools, copyright and licensing and copywriting and editing are all essential aspects of this um, projects in itself, but the way to learn about this was to do it so that experiential learning and including everyone in the process. Um, students open to learning and collaborating in new ideas, the mindset, the trust, the relationship building with these students and the fact that they they took those risks and were willing to take those risks. And we did have some funding from the University of Calgary teaching and learning grants, which helped us with the second iteration of the course. Um, however, we have learned without that grant funding, so we have no grant funding anymore, it is much more challenging to meet some of the needs in terms of copy editing and meeting the needs for those final textbooks or press books. Some benefits. Michelle, would you like to share some of the benefits? Well, and I think some of the benefits have been made clear already, um, but certainly um, Nicole has talked about doing um, assignments that are authentic, um, things that live beyond and have uh, meaning, relevance, and impact um, in the world and connect students to a network or a community of practice. Certainly we observed high levels of student engagement. All of the students were given choice whether or not to take part um, in the OER um, project and make their work public after the course. They all, though part of, as part of the coursework, engaged in these knowledge building activities in community. Um, and we also feel that um, a clear benefit is a development of a community of learners within the course, but that has also been sustained. And we've talked about how, you know, the connections have spread out um, with each iteration of the of the uh, four course graduate certificate. So our findings and we were documenting them in a number of different ways um, really do emphasize how um, that by developing human interactions and building relationships through co design um, and integrating digital tools and open educational practices that that enabled this development of an OER it also provided authentic scholarly activity that engaged graduate students and their instructors and the research team in collaborative knowledge building. So lots of benefits. Um, I'm just highlighting three of them here. Um, there are also some challenges that Marina will talk about. I'll briefly mention them. They are, um, of course, balancing open and closed learning within digital platforms, also within mindsets um, and resources. The digital literacy skills, it's essential. I was working with graduate students with high digital literacy skills, but you could see a lot of difference in their uh, capabilities based on those competencies that they developed. And the most important part is ad adaptation for replication and sustainability. Ability. Um, I, this would be really hard to do without my team. And so that is where we end. And we want to thank you. Uh, yes, this is fantastic, really. And you were speaking about the fact that at some point you are alone <laughs> doing <laughs> things on your own, having some colleagues, you call and they accept and you work together. So Really well done, and I am happy to have that conference to hear about you all <laughs> and to recognize all your good work. Well done, really fantastic. And it's uh, really clear, it's inspiring, and uh, I thank you. Is there any question? Uh, I must say I'm at home, of course. <laughs> so you may hear some voices around. Many of the comments in the chat are, are talking about Nicole's experience, so maybe someone has some question ab about the student experience and how it's impacted her. Maybe she wants to expand on that. Nicole? I'm trying to go back in the, the yeah. chat box. They're, most of them are talking about they can relate to deepening your knowledge and understanding 
by being immersed in this project. Are there other students that are involved? Like I might know about this, but what do you think, Nicole? What are some of the benefits of being involved in this project? Uh, from a student perspective? Yeah. Um, I would definitely say the connections. So I've been able to connect with networks and it that I don't think I would have otherwise if I hadn't been in the course. It, I was on Twitter, for example, before, but not really interacting with it. And so I think it was a bit of a catalyst for me to reach out and connect to different communities, especially the open community. So GoGN or other networks. Uh, were you hesitant at any point to become involved? That's an <laughs> awesome question, Lena. Yes, I was the worst. Um, I started this being like, I was in the Middle East as well. And so if you're working remotely or teaching, learning remotely, the um, copyright laws are different in every country that you're in and with every school board you work with. So I was really uncomfortable because I didn't fully understand the country I was living in, all of the legal ramifications of me publishing and if my school actually owned my work and I was allowed to. So yes, I was incredibly hesitant at first to share. I had an aha moment halfway through. Um, I work a lot with Writers Workshop, which is very similar and you give students voice and choice in their product and what they're writing. And eventually you try and put it out to the public, to a public audience, whether that's just their parents that come in or you publish it in a little notebook at a cafe. It, it makes it more real for them. And so halfway through, um, I was hesitant and I talked to Dr. Roberts and it clicked and I was like, oh, I do this to my students. I know what's going on. I was like, I get it. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm not going to fail. My grade isn't going to be negative. Like it's the process that I'm going through that's more important. And then once I had that aha and I clicked, I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm in. Let's share this. I'm still scared. Obviously, I put it out and I'm still like, I'm not the expert. I'm a student. I can collect information, but who am I to be like, yes, I'm the expert on 3D printing. I'm not, but it's changing my mindset on, it's a starting point and it, it gets me into the conversation. So, so yes, I was hesitant at first. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm trying to look at and see if I've got other ones in there. Uh, what would help students jump over the hesitancy? I think understanding, developing their understanding of open. Thanks, Alan. Alan, nice to see you again. Um, and that's something we're working on a little bit with the podcast too. I didn't know what open was before I got involved in this project. I didn't know where my information was going to go. I, I really had no idea. So I think understanding that community and how those spaces interact and work and what OER is, if I knew a bit more about that, I probably would have jumped in faster, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> munching carrots <laughs> yes awesome that's great yes fantastic thank you all yeah, for, no uh it's it's great to share also the the best practices <laughs> and uh, it's not always the best practices like uh, it was easy and it's fun and so on it's exciting it's sometimes difficult sometimes you have to motivate yourself <laughs> and uh, we all know uh learning and teaching is not something easy <laughs> it would be uh, well known it's something hard and uh, people speak a lot of about soft skills but in the end learning is a quite a hard experience harsh but it's it's worth it so thank you you have learned a lot Nepal, working in that project Thank you. I will go uh, to the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Verena, Michel, Nicole. Is that us, Perrine? Are we next? Please, yes, Lena and okay. Lena. Come on. Open futures for micro credentialing. Uh, you have also Tanis Morgan with you. Please go on. Go ahead, Deb. You want to start us off? I thought you were going to start, Lena. Am I yeah. starting? <laughs> I just remind you that uh, Lena is I'm the president happy. of Open Education Global. So I'm happy to see her. I don't know. Um, do not need to be nice. the first person to speak <laughs> by any means. Okay. <laughs> Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Perrine. Thank you for having us. Um, it's so fun listening to everybody else reflect on their um, 
unexpectedly rich collaborations over virtual spaces. This presentation is exactly that. Um, Tennis and Deb and I found each other um, through accident in Twitter DM uh, because we kind of saw some pieces aligning in spaces that we were working in and thought, you know, we need to think about this a little bit more. And, um, and we saw in each other, I think, and I'm, and I'm speaking mostly for myself here, but I hope, I hope the others agree. We saw in each other an opportunity um, to connect some dots in, in things that we were thinking about, but maybe didn't have the spaces to really explore fully. And so I think in just finding each other and in putting this present to presentation together, we created that space for ourselves. We enjoyed that conversation. And what we want to do today is open that up further um, to even more people through this presentation. So we are going to be um, spending a little bit of time speaking about some things, and then we are gonna move into an activity where we hope to engage with you all. So first we'll start with introductions um, and maybe, um, uh, Deb, do you wanna introduce yourself first and then we'll go to Tannis and then to me. How about that? Okay, let's do it that way. Yeah, so hello everybody. Uh, Deborah Arnold uh, here from France. I'm in Dijon, which is somewhere in the middle on the Eastern side of France. Um, I work as National and International Projects Coordinator at UNEJ, which is the French Digital University for Economics and Management Studies. Uh, we are a part of uh, L'Université Numérique, uh, which is the French organization which groups all the disciplinary um, organizations, let's say, which uh, foster open educational resources and practice uh, at national level. And uh, we're very, very happy to be more and more involved in Open Education Global as, uh, as things develop. So very happy to be here. And hi everybody, I'm Tanis Morgan. I'm coming to you today from Vancouver, Canada, which um, is on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, I am an uninvited settler here. And I do want to just say that we are coming off a day of national recognition of truth and reconciliation, which has been a process, um, ongoing process here in Canada. Most importantly that um, has recently recognized the genocide against Indigenous children um, and the ongoing injustices that um, continue today towards Indigenous peoples. And as settlers and non-Indigenous people, we are asked to unlearn, learn, and take action to address this. So thank you. And I will just add to Tanis's land acknowledgement my own. Um, so I am based in Toronto, Ontario, which is the traditional home of the Mississaugas of the new Credit First Nation. Um, and the, Toronto is covered under Treaty 13 territory, uh, which is a treaty that dates back to the 1800s. Um, and so it's very different from the unceded territories that some of my other colleagues are, are on um, in Canada and in, and in living on treaty territory, one of the things um, that we really uh, try to unlearn and learn about is um, the treaty as a colonial construct and um, as and as a construct of the government at the time, um, which contains within it a fundamental assumption about ownership of the land, which is uh, counter to Indigenous ways of knowing. And so one of the things that I like to do um, in my effort to learn more is learn more about um, the Toronto Purchase. And I'm just going to drop um, a couple links in the chat as well. If anybody is interested in learning more about um, the Toronto Purchase specifically or about what Tannis mentioned about um, truth and reconciliation in Canada, I invite you to uh, visit those links. Okay, Deb, over to you um, to start us off on our journey here. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, both of you. Um, and Lena, uh, the feeling is mutual that uh, when the three of us came together and started this conversation, um, it was about um, uh, getting that conversation going and, and, and looking at, at, at what spaces that conversation needs to, needs to in, invest. So we hope that uh, uh, those of you who've joined us for this session will, will join us on this, on this journey 
Um, we're going to be unpacking quite a few of the concepts behind um, our quite general title, Open Futures for Micro-Credentialing. Um, looking very, very quickly, uh, but in detail about what we mean when we say micro-credential, um, looking at what we mean when we say recognition, and then linking that, bridging that conversation with um, the, the idea of open values and what we as a community um, believe those values to be. Um, and they can be multiple, they can be diverse. Uh, we will see about that. Um, and then um, we've got a little activity as well, um, which will be very nice for the people who are joining from France to keep you awake because it's late here. Um, and, and we'd like really to, uh, to get this conversation going. Um, so as I said, bridging narratives around openness and micro-credentialing. And when we're talking about those values, um, the three of us were very, very inspired by uh, the work of Lou Mycroft. Uh, you may know, um, uh, we've shared a link to her um, uh, keynote presentation at the last ALT conference, which was a, a real spark of, of inspiration on um, uncovering our values line. Uh, Lou talks about uh, the fact that we will never ever be able to get away from the KPI line, the key performance indicators. But if we resurface that values line, then we can begin to shift the conversation to a different space. First of all, as we said, what do we mean when we say micro-credential? It's a term that's being used in many, many different ways these days. Um, yesterday on Twitter, I saw an announcement, sign up for the MIT micro-credential in. Okay, for me, that's a course. Here, where we're talking about micro-credentials, we're talking about the artifact. And if you look at the definitions which are coming um, coming up at the moment, as Beverly Oliver says in, in her uh, very recent report uh, uh, to UNESCO, it's a conversation starter. Um, but we've got this micro-credential as an artifact. It's a record of focused learning achievement. I'm not going to go through and read everything on the slide. What we've done here is we've put um, this proposal from Beverly Oliver from the work done with a group of experts um, at UNESCO level. And then we've got the European Commission definition. So I'm just going to leave us in a little bit of silence for a few moments and ask you to take a look at these two definitions. See if you can highlight the differences. Is there a difference of focus? Is there different vocabulary being used? Is there something present in one that isn't in the other? Um, we're still at early stages here coming to definitions. So uh, we know that these are not final, but I will leave you that silence for a few moments to digest these two definitions. Okay, I'm not actually looking at the chat, so if there are reactions coming in on the chat, then uh, uh, I'll let uh, uh, Lena or, or, or Tanis pick up on them. Nothing in the it's a bit yet. of a spot the difference, a bit of a spot the difference activity. Um, let me just pull up one, which is very, very interesting. Um, in the European Commission definition, there are the words micro credentials are owned by the learner. We don't find those in the other definition. But in fact, if you read the, the paper and we've linked to um, uh, we've linked to that report uh, in the slides and we'll we'll put a direct link as well in the in the, in the conference space. Um, uh, Beverly Oliver just does explain uh, the process that some things had to be let go. And she explains why that particular group decided to let certain things go. But it's it's something to pay attention to that. Uh, uh, we're in this moving space of, of definitions at the moment. To make it more concrete, perhaps it's useful at this stage to look at what um, a micro-credential actually looks like. Now, you might say it's a certificate, it's a badge. Um, what we're interested in here, and I could talk about this for days, but uh, we don't have much time. I'd like us to look at two different angles here. First of all, um, the, the contents of what the, the, uh, the credential 
contains. Um, and then this whole aspect of authentication and verification. Um, and in fact, when we're talking about micro credentials, I find that we're always having um, to zoom in and to zoom out, zooming into the, the, the real details of what goes on when we're describing learning achievements, when we're describing activities, the assessment that takes place, the entitlements, what can a learner do with a particular credential at whatever level. Um, uh, it could be a micro credential, it could be representative of, um, uh, of a whole diploma, it could be recognition of peer learning. Um, these credentials are size neutral. I think that's one of the messages that um, I want to get across. Um, we chose here the Certificate of International Competence, which is a real example that we're working on uh, with uh, a university and a group of universities uh, at, uh, at European level. And then you've got this aspect of uh, uh, authentic authentication and verification, uh, the whole technical system that goes on to ensure the validity of the credential, uh, that there is trust, that there is transparency. Um, of, uh, of the uh, awarding organization. And, and what we're doing, in fact, um, in uh, an Erasmus Plus project called ECHO, which is the European, should be credential clearing house for opening up education, uh, is that we're looking at the quality criteria behind these, linking them with learning opportunities, because that's where the learning happens. Um, and we're also looking at this question of, of recognition. And so we're testing and refining all the processes involved from a technical, administrative and pedagogical perspective uh, to support uh, all the stakeholders involved from institutional level right through to uh, obviously the learners. And then from the learners perspective, what we can see here in what's called the Europass wallet, which is uh, run and developed and run by the European Commission um, is the whole collection of, um, uh, of, of micro credentials and we begin to see how these can be uh, how these can be linked between them, how they can be stackable um, and more importantly how they can be recognized. And this is why I'd like to hand over to uh, to Tanis who's going to talk us through this question of, uh, of recognition. Well, thank you so much um, for that. Um, I just need to start by saying that I, I don't bring the same depth and, and knowledge as of micro-credentials as um, Deborah or Lena, but one of the areas where I've really been putting my head is around the recognition piece, um, in particular as it relates to prior learning and assessment recognition, or, or PLAR as we say here in Canada, or RPL and other places. So for me, um, recognition is really a key part of making micro-credentials work as far as I can see it. The flip side of this coin is really the question of whether the micro-credential benefits um, the people we say it'll benefit and in the desired ways. And of course, almost every discussion of micro-credentials comes with the reminder of the benefits of them to stakeholders um, who include employers, career shifters, um, students trying to gain additional competencies in their programs, or prospective students who want to ladder into higher credentials, um, in addition to immigrants and low-income workers. Um, but underlining all of this, is there seems to be a strong theme of seeking better livelihoods through micro-credentialing. So this, of course, leads us to a question as to who recognizes the micro-credential and who has the authority to recognize it. And arguably, both higher education um, and employers have always done some sort of short course knowledge and skill training. So the new here, in my understanding, is really not the micro. It's really the digital platforms that make the verification and exposure of what the micro-credential is all about more visible via the metadata. Um, and of course, we saw that in Deborah's previous slide, just what that looks like from a Europass um, perspective. So this might be good news for higher education and PLAR people in that the, a combination of portfolio and digital micro-credentialing data um, might help speed up the laborious PLAR processes um, or even add an additional dimension. But the extent to which higher education will recognize employer or even community-based um, micro-credentials is something to consider. And of course, the reverse is also true. So I think it's gonna be important for higher education to understand that community-based recognition. And I think um, 
well, I don't have a link in here, but I'm pointing here to the Open Recognition Alliance in France. I think it's called Reconnat. Um, you know, and also the employer-based recognition. I mean, higher education has to understand that this is also part of the landscape. So I think this can um, segue us to the next slide, actually, if you um, don't mind, Deborah. This is a, a, a visual from David Porter and Associates. Um, he created this quite recently, and it to me, this really speaks to the what is being recognized in relation to PLAR. Um, and you can see here that, you know, not only what I, what I like is it shows the intersection of how micro-credential fits into, you know, in a way past and future practices around um, an envelope of PLAR. And of course, the question of, you know, what is being recognized, is it knowledge and competencies, knowledge or competencies? I mean, this is, you know, a question that's come up quite a bit in, in um, these discussions as well. And then I'll just jump to the next slide, actually. So along the lines of who recognizes, um, we also have to remember that not unlike openness, just because something new has been created with an aspiration of improving livelihoods doesn't necessarily make it more equitable. Like equity has to be a consideration in the design. So for example, here in, in Canada, decolonization and higher education will need to seriously examine how the recognition of indigenous knowledge is part of our PLAR realities. And also to that, you could extend that to micro-credential realities. The epistemic justice part of openness is a relatively new discussion in our, in the global north anyways. And since recognition is required to make micro-credentials work, I think it's helpful to turn to efforts like the one that's on this slide, which is called the Indigenous Collective, who in the space of PLAR are really underlining this need. So it's another thing that I think a dimension of micro -cred credentials, but also to some extent, openness doesn't really get discussed perhaps as much as it should. So like openness, you know, what kinds of new spaces open up when we consider equity as part of the process? How can things like co-creation and open values help shape this direction? That's really, you know, what's leading us into the next um, piece, which is our activity. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, that's really, that's wonderful. Thank you, Tannis and Deborah. I hope that everybody feels um, like that, those two pieces about what we mean when we say micro-credential and what we mean when we say recognition have, um, if not left you with a sense of clarity, at least have provoked some questions for you and got you thinking along uh, a couple of different tracks. And I just want to, uh, before we start our activity, I want to, I just want to structure it, give you some, some sense of purpose here. So as Deborah mentioned, um, we're really inspired by the work of Lou Mycroft. And I did, I did drop a link to her uh, keynote speech uh, that she gave at the alt conference in OEG Connect under our session. So highly encourage you to go watch it. It is like, will totally blow your mind. But one of the things she talks about, like Deborah says, is that is that idea of having a values line to run along a KPI line in parallel and hopefully at some point along the horizon intersecting. One of the reasons why we were inspired to have this conversation and create this space is because we're feeling as though the values line and the micro-credentialing conversation has not been articulated. It's not been articulated clearly. We don't feel as though we know where it lies. We don't feel as though we know um, what that part of the work looks like. There is a lot of attention being paid to the KPI line, right? Like Tanis mentioned, there's a lot of people who are, who are very focused on outcomes. Um, there's a lot of people who are very focused on, on performance. And that is important. It is an important piece of the conversation, but it needs to be balanced and it needs to be balanced alongside that values line. And so what we really want to do here is draw on your experience as open advocates, draw on your experience as open educators, ask you to articulate what values you bring to open education that the micro-credentialing conversation might benefit from, okay? So that's going to be the first thing that we're going to do together. And I want you to use the chat first in order to do this. So if everyone could just take one minute, I want you to think about what word or a couple of words or a phrase 
you associate with open values? Accessible. Thank you, Verena. That's a really good one. What else? Generosity, equity, transparency, openness, caring, care, yes, transparency, sharing. I'm going to put in reciprocity, if I can spell it, yeah, collaboration, innovation, innovation, that's nice. I think innovation usually gets gets pushed into the KPI line pre as a as a as a concept there. So I really like seeing it as a value. I, I'd love to hear more about that. Inclusivity, togetherness, togetherness. I love that. Connection. Empathy. Thank you, Eba. That's lovely. So we're talking about open values here. We're still on open values. Anything else? These are all lovely. Transparency, I really like. Generosity is great. Connected to that, like attribution, you know, those kinds of things that we hold hold dear. Giving, giving and, and receiving and that reciprocity loop. Okay, that's wonderful. Deborah, could you go to the next slide for me, please? I can. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this is our next, this is the next portion of the activity. Um, the idea is, is that we get to, we take our values words and we put them into a sentence of practice. So the, the, the construct of the sentence is what might this activity look like as a practice of one of the values that you have articulated. So an example might be, what might micro-credentialing look like as a practice of care? And somebody said care as, an, as a value and then really appreciate that. Some other examples of activities, it's not just right micro-credentialing we're talking about, but it's recognition. It might be assessment. Tennis brought up prior recognition of learning. It might be something like that. So take your value word, pick an activity. It could be from this list. It could be another activity that you think is important and string them together into that sentence and share that sentence, whoops, book, share that sentence in the chat. Got it? What might pick an activity look like as a practice of the value that you have shared or that you have seen someone else share that you think really deserves to be linked together? Thanks, Tannis. What might PLAR look like as a practice of equity? What might assessment look like as a practice of equity? Anyone else want to string, string a connection together? What might the approach to micro-credential policy look like as a practice of togetherness? Wow. That's, <laughs> that's great. That's, that's great. Like, wow. Like, we could really go places with that. What might accessibility look like as a practice of transparency? Wonderful. What assessment as an act of generosity? That's a challenge. Yeah. What might assessment look like as a practice of generosity? Mm. <laughs> it's brilliant. Can we record this chat? <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> Assessment look look like as a practice of generosity. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. What might what might recognition look like as a practice of <gasps> respect? Kate. Thank you for that. Okay. Are we still going? 
what might yeah I know mm -hmm. it really is um it really is thought provoking because what we're so just so you all know what we hope to do is cap capture this thank you put it together um and 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 hope that it can be the beginning of uh, articulating the values line for micro credentialing going forward because our hunch is that uh, the open education community has a lot to say and contribute on this topic. And so thank you so much. I think I, we can end it there. Um, I, uh, we're out of time, but I wanna thank you all for your contributions and for helping us start down this path because um, it's, it, it matters a lot to us uh, that that our work is grounded um, on these values. So, can, I mean, if you want to continue to add them, thank you, Shannon. What might co-creation look like as a practice of care? Thank you, Deborah and Tanis, for joining me in this. So I think we've got a lot thank to think you about much. here. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I'm just picking up on on what um, Stacy has said in in the chat. Um, uh, bringing the values to these statements is so meaningful and moving and I think it, it is because it's uh it, it's it's reframing the conversation and uh, and reclaiming the conversation as well um so thanks you to, to both of you I really enjoyed preparing this session with you um and uh there's so much work to build on um uh as an open educational resource um and and practice uh to come to come out of this Yes, thank you all. I'll just leave I you with the. Uh, Sorry, Tanis, I... Oh, I was just going to say um, thank you, thank you all for your valuable participation, and um, perhaps we will be able one day to be doing this back together again, practicing our value of to get togetherness and openness. I thank you very much. So I must say that for, as as far I'm concerned, I I am. Uh, very much in, in, in values, but uh, on uh, climate and uh, no digital sobriety, <laughs> not uh, too much, but on the other hand, recognition of uh, that hard work we were speaking about before, everything we're doing is, uh, uh, is great, but sometimes we need to be able to make it visible, <laughs> which is the perfect uh, transition to the next uh, step. Uh, making open visible a multinational undergraduate student network for mapping OER. But I must say that for me, as far as I'm concerned, my first idea was blockchain and where on open education and recognize, recognizing all the practitioners and people who were involving themselves on the time and personal time, not only a professional time for open, um, open practices. And uh, this is a... Um, uh, an, an idea uh, that I, we, we had in the chat with Alan, yes, uh, this award should not be just uh, an award like that in our OEG Connect, which is a great platform, uh, I love it, but it should be interoperable, should be a small piece of recognition. Serge Rave uh, from this association called Reconnect say a bit of trust. Uh, that we where we are recognized and we build our community and not only speakers but uh, participants could be recognized as such and maybe become also uh, speakers next time it's an encouragement it's an assessment just one word to tell you that within my university because i have been hosting for now four years uh, a working a national working group on uh, on uh, blockchain and education. It has led this year uh, to uh, a huge uh, uh, digitization of the schooling departments. Uh, it's involving a lot of people. Uh, I count uh, 18 people from my university from five different directorates to uh, transform the way we are issuing, sharing, storage, storing diplomas. But we can work also on open badges. 
and an other way of certificate recognitions. Uh, it's always the same digital format, which is called a verifiable credential. And it's really interesting to, to work at European level and international level to see that we are all speaking about the same recognition. And it's not only within universities, but also within other organization where people have no diploma, nothing. <laughs> so you see, it's just about people who are, have no jobs, or have not been recognized for a while. So you can say, okay, we will recognize them. We will do all the pedagogy we will bring them to another point, you know, from where they are. We take them as they are. We recognize what they have done, some skills and self-esteem. But in the end, if you don't have a paper, and if we say paper, why not also a digital bit of trust, a digital small piece? Uh, why do it? Uh, they will not be able to show it on a CV or or to share it on any social network. So I like that idea that recognition is put into a paper. It can be an official recognition, an assessment. It can come from just a practice, a good practice. It's, uh, it, it's doing good to people. It makes uh, the, the, some assessment visible. I like that idea and this is why I am working on that a lot. Uh, right, <laughs> right uh, now, and uh, and it has been for years, and it will be for the next years, I guess. So now I leave the floor to the last uh, session. I already said the title. Please uh, come on. Thank you, uh, Lena, Deborah, and uh, she has left. <laughs> of course. Uh, um, what was your name? Sorry, Tanis. Yes, thank Tanis. you. Yes, thank you, Tanis. So now, up. Yes, it's Chico Suarez, Daniel, Juliana Puerta, Jaco Oliver, Andrea Beatriz Bartoli, Fatima Beider, Luca Pellerino, Robson da Cruz de Mesquita. Uh, Sebastian Zapatero Nunes. Thank you very much. I don't think you are all there, but many of, many of you are. Many yeah, yeah. yeah yes. Uh, greetings from Brazil. Uh, good afternoon. It's 4.30 uh, here. Uh, thanks for having us. Actually, we'll be speaking on the behalf of the whole of our research group, but uh, we are, uh, there's four of us here. It's me, Thiago. I'm uh, the researcher in, in, in charge of the, the research project. Uh, hello there. Uh, uh, Professor Yaku, who was also uh, uh, working with us, and two of our, two of our uh, young researchers, uh, Hobson and Fatima. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Please let me know if, uh, if it's, uh, being shown just just a second uh, okay can everyone see it yes it okay so uh, uh, well uh, it, it's so I'll try to to, <laughs> to be quick because uh, there's a lot to be said uh, actually uh, we're here we are here to present this uh, uh, effort on, on uh, mapping out uh, open educational resources and repositories in Latin America and uh, South Africa. Uh, but first, I'd like to actually uh, share with you some of the questions that were in our mind when we were designing this project. Uh, being from uh, from South America, there's this huge diversity of projects of, uh, of 
uh, uh, different approaches to education and openness and technology. But at the same time, there's this sort of common ground. Some that, that there's this this possibility for us to uh, build up networks and work together, even those like from country to country, from com community to community, from uh, geographical region to geographical region and, and uh, language to language. There's there, there are these differences because uh, that there's no lack of projects here or or uh, repositories or re resources uh, themselves. Because in Brazil, for example, we have this. Uh, this public investment uh, throughout this last decade that uh, has actually been uh, quite uh, rich. So uh, we were, uh, we, we had uh, as our first uh, uh, objective to, uh, uh, to, to make these projects visible and to connect them and actually to to build up uh, a network and a community uh, through throughout this this initiative uh, so uh, we uh, work with uh, universities and professors and students from five countries uh, brazil uh, where the coordination of the project uh, was and argentina colombia uruguay and south africa uh, and the idea was to actually uh, invite some uh, undergrad, uh, undergrad, undergraduate students uh, uh, as uh, young researchers that could help us in mapping out OER and, and at, at a later stage, uh, do some ex active uh, search for new projects. Uh, and these students, they were uh, followed closely by their uh, supervisors in each of their universities. Uh, and I, I was uh, following them as well, as following them as well as in, in helping them in having a better understanding of uh, 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 some institutional or technical or uh, 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 more, more conceptual uh, aspects of openness and OER and having the UNESCO uh, definition as our, our uh, the, 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 our, our idea of, of openness. We work with the universe, with uh, the Universidade de Brasília. Uh, that's uh, actually uh, the institution I'm affiliated with. I, I'm working with the UNESCO Chair in Distance Education and their research group and the uh, Iniciativa Educação Aberta that uh, works closely with them. Uh, and Theo Amiel, who couldn't join us uh, today, but he's been uh, a very important part of this project. Uh, and we also work with the Fundação Universitária Tecnológico Continalco from Colombia, the Universidade Nacional de la Patagonia Austral from Argentina. Uh, the Universidad de la República de Uruguay and North, Northwest University from South Africa. And now we jump to the more hands-on uh, aspect of, of the project. We, we had this project revolving a lot, about, a, a lot around the OER world map that has, uh, it, it, it has served as both a resource and actually some, some kind of infrastructure. I don't know if uh, you uh, from the audience are acquainted with the OER world map, but the OER world map is an open and collaborative map that uh, uh, anyone can contribute and uh, access the information. So we had this this database there that we used as our our uh, first resource, and from the OER world map we uh, had. Uh, uh, the, 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 our first, uh, our first list of projects to be revised. And we, we went th through four categories, organizations, projects, services, and policies. And we tried to, 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 to do this like big sweep. So we, we went, uh, through like many countries, Argentina, Brazil, Brazil, uh, was actually more like an update because the first run of the project was, 
uh, uh, a first uh, review and, and listing of projects only in Brazil. So we expanded and the, the version I'm, I'm presenting, presenting here is the expanded version. Uh, uh, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama, uh, Dominican Republic, Uruguay, and South Africa. And what we actually did was to, to have the OER word map uh, database exported as spreadsheets. We worked closely with their uh, tech team. And from that, we uh, had this first listing of projects that were uh, reviewed uh, by uh, our uh, students. And they, they, they went uh, uh, through the projects and they flagged out inconsistencies, added metadata where metadata were needed. And uh, after their review, uh, we uh, uh, suggested uh, that they uh, peer, uh, made, made some peer reviewing of the, their, their colleagues. So uh, each student went uh, through the protest, then their work was uh, uh, reviewed by another student. And I kind of triple, triple checked to see if everything uh, was was going according to plan, uh, but but actually to 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 do the review, it's important to to have a, a clear grasp on what exactly uh, openness and OER and uh, education technology and and licensing and policies, uh, how, how these things are. So uh, we uh, promoted uh, some. Uh, uh, webinars and discussions and uh, and had weekly meetings on these subjects and from their experience in reviewing the projects and having to to, to learn how to navigate them we we had discussions where this hands-on approach was intertwined with this more conceptual uh, 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 learning uh, it, it, our idea was to 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 actually be able to to promote this capacity building in OER uh, with uh, young researchers and students that could act as as some new ambassadors or multipliers and and nodes uh, in their communities and 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 that could help uh, help out some 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 of their their uh, colleagues. And everything, uh, and from this first phase, we and once the students had this this uh, this clear understanding of OER and uh, how it works, we went uh, through a second phase, a phase two, where they uh, engaged in, engaged in uh, active searching for new projects, uh, and it it, it uh, we uh, suggested that they. Uh, reached out to uh, experts in their countries and to actually do some uh, online searching and go to, to go through some databases where they could find some new new projects and licenses and policies and, and uh, repositories that could be added to the OER uh, word map. And uh, just like at the same at the first phase, uh, they they reviewed the, their their colleagues' work, and I uh, double checked their their work. And uh, aside from the 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 meetings, the weekly meetings, and the webinars, and the 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 workshops, we had a, a, a Telegram group uh, where we had this uh, kind of support where where any uh, doubt that could uh, pop up could be uh, quickly addressed by, by me or, or some of the other colleagues that had already uh, went through some of, of the, the problems or, or questions that could arise. And uh, uh, well, now I, I, I I believe that it would be interesting for us to uh, hear from uh, those who, who who are the, the best ones to to share with us what their experiences uh, with the mapping were and uh, what they 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 uh, 
they went through and 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 what what how 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 uh, it it how they experienced it. So I'd like to invite uh, two of our young researchers. First, so I'll invite Hobson, who was kind of our, our a go to tutor to the other students. He was part of the first run of the project where we just went through Brazilian uh, projects. So he had this uh, firsthand experience where he could uh, help out their like our, our, our his colleagues with uh, 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 conceptual or, or technical uh, uh, questions that that. Uh, uh, could appear. So Hobson, please, uh, I'd like uh, that you could share with us uh, some of, of uh, your experience. Uh, and, and I just, uh, before uh, before uh, giving you the word, Hobson was uh, uh, actually responsible for the, the 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 review of uh, all of the other countries, aside from uh, the one for Argen from Argentina, Colombia, and Uruguay, uh, where we had uh, our students uh, mapping out their own countries. So he has he, he has been able to through through this project uh, have this really wide understanding of uh, the, the the whole of the Latin American uh, uh, ecosystem. And the results we had were, were quite significant from, from this project. Like uh, uh, we, we, we not just uh, reviewed projects, flagged out some inconsistencies, but, that, but also find out, found out some projects and, and, and helped out uh, uh, connecting them. So I, I'm sharing with you here some of our, our results. And, uh, and two, Two cases were especially significant that the, the case of Cuba and Bolivia that were uh, countries that we believe that were underrepresented uh, on the we are world map and we've been able to 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 uh, uh, to, to find out and give visibility to to many many uh, initiatives and uh, in just two cases uh, the, the, we, we didn't have a, a, a significant increase in projects found. But uh, yeah, Hobson, please, uh, could you share with us your experience? Yes, of course. Um, I took part in two rounds of the mapping and update of the OER roadmap. There were uh, two of the best experience of my graduation in pedagogy. I could deepen my knowledge about OER, learn more about the reality of my country and neighboring countries uh, on the subject. This also have been opportunity to, to have a broader understanding to whole whole process of doing uh, research from doing the mapping to going through the data to writing down papers and participate in the events. Uh, the result of this experience go beyond important data updating and include in the OER roadmap and includes the creation of a network of research that has everything to maintain itself growing and happen in other countries. Thank you, Hobson. And I'd like to invite now Fatima to share with us uh, her experience. Please, Fatima. Thank you so much, Tiago. So an investigation into the nature of OER in South Africa through the process of analyzing organization services and policies on the OER world map, it has offered valuable insights into prominent themes that characterize the OER landscape in South Africa. With the revision of 2018 initially identified projects and the insertion of three organizations, two services and two policies on the OER world map thereafter, 
an analysis of 35 OER projects in total revealed characteristics of an advancement in indigenous ways of knowing through the availability of culturally driven learning resources as nurtured through the service African Storybook Initiative, for example. In addition, the nature of OER in South Africa is further characterized by efforts towards strengthening the availability of contextualized and meaningful learning resources for South African learners, as depicted by the organizations OER Africa, Africa Center, Wiki in Africa, among others. In summary, the OER landscape in South Africa has explored through projects on the OER world map. It reflects progression towards supporting the development of education through the promotion of openness. My reflection on the project in its entirety has offered me a new lens through which transformation in education can be pursued. Um, as access to quality education is progressively realized through the presence of OER in South Africa, my personal involve, involvement in the project, it has nurtured an understanding of the potential of technology in disrupting the traditional educational landscape on both the national and global spectrum. Thank you so much, Fatima. And now I'd like to, to uh, invite Professor Yaku, who uh, has been a very important part of the project as well. Professor Yaku, please. Thank you very much, uh, Tiago. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Um, as you can see, the, the, the listings on the map reflect the realities on the ground. And it was interesting for us to engage with this uh, on another level, to compare countries, to, to get a sense of uh, what is going on in terms of the OER uh, world, open education, uh, not just as resources, but as a movement. And for us, especially student involvement um, was quite uh, an important aspect. And, and I think the affordances are, are clear. Um, as is stated there, uh, for us, that is between uh, Telemiel and myself, it was also important to establish South-South um, collaboration in this context. Tiago, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this project, as I said, highlights the affordances of cross-border research and networking, even with language barriers. It was amazing that the project could involve lectures, postgraduate, and even undergraduate students. Engaging with repositories such as this can, in fact, me become a means to inform, and they're not just resources that we work with, but to get a sense of what openness and a wider trends of open education involve. Open licensing seems to be an important aspect. We need to empower teachers and students and, and people who can potentially add resources to repositories like this to understand what licensing can involve. Um, we even found in the South African case um, where governmental documentation um, were not sufficiently licensed. Um, the need for further collaboration and critical engagement with platforms such as these are essential. Um, the world map and the approach we followed creates possibilities for comparative research to be done. From this project already, we have uh, finished an article comparing resources from the OER world map between South Africa and Brazil. And for that, I need to thank um, our colleagues from Brazil, Tiago, and the rest of South America for, for bringing us in to allow us to be part of this discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tiago. Thank you very much, Yako. And well, uh, thank you everyone uh, for having us. I hope we could give you a very uh, quick but uh, comprehensive over overview of uh, what has been our work so far. We uh, have been working for uh, nearly two semesters now and have just finished up this part of the mapping. And we'll... Uh, keep working on, uh, if not uh, with the, the, the mapping itself in uh, further collaboration, be it uh, in uh, writing uh, papers or, or having it as a resource to, to further research or even, even uh, uh, being part of conferences like, like what we're doing now. So yeah, uh, thank you so much. I, 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 I'm sorry if I had been a, a bit too rushed through, through my, my part because th there's so much to, to, to tell and we had like 
uh, uh, not that much time. And I believe that the most important thing would be to give all of us uh, some voice and and to to have this uh, this uh, this diverse view of what the experience has been. Thank you, thank you so much. And Chago, this was fantastic. Uh, look, you already had the award yesterday, so you see it's a UNESCO OER Implementation Award. It's great. You have contributed uh, by speaking, by uh, being a member of that community to a better world, I would say, to make it uh, very simple. So now it's great. It's um, it, I always thought that involving students were the key, the key in everything we would be doing. Because, of course, if you don't involve students, uh, the risk is to just speak uh, beyond people that already understand what they're doing, which is not very interesting. <laughs> Once you have been convinced, you have to tell other people that this is a very interesting way to have access, a better access to education for anyone, and, uh, and to share values, of course, uh, too, like we said uh, before. So I am just uh, checking. Uh, if there have been, um, uh, I guess uh, maybe it's becoming, you know, you're, you are presenting uh, the last, which is uh, also sometimes a bit difficult. I saw that Colin de la Egera, who, who is the organizer uh, with the University of Nantes is here. So I will kindly ask him to come to the stage with uh, Thiago and maybe all the speaker of this session. Please open your camera. Hello, everybody. Thiago, come. Come, Thiago, too. Stay on the scene, stay on the stage. Now, Colin, welcome. You will be the one who will be speaking. I think it's nice. I think it's the last session to, to have everyone uh, open its camera. And uh, it has been a pleasure sharing this last session. Uh, we have been um, enjoying uh, receiving as speakers um, this award, but also uh, to learn more about uh, a Wikipedia, um, a, a reading Wikipedia in the, in the classroom, which uh, was uh, very interesting. And uh, a lot about uh, the open education, co-design and co-creation. We spoke in the chat also about this language act and we were not able to make this week, but we will organize for Nantes next year in May. Uh, there were many and successful uh, stories to hear about, to get inspired to. And uh, I, I thank you because I saw Paul uh, Stacy's message uh, yesterday saying that uh, this multilingual uh, conference, it's a first uh, multilingual uh, conference was a big success. It's true that you, we can't have uh, many sessions in other languages, but already to have uh, had that idea, Colin, you, this is a fantastic work. This time I, I presented this morning uh, to some colleagues what we have done uh, for the francophone community. Um, I haven't spoken about it uh, today, but I, I really hear that all week has been dedicated to people um, sharing all around the world uh, these methods in uh, five uh, languages, the five languages recognized uh, officially by the UNESCO. So I think you, you did something great and it will be even better next year. Again, in not, but this time uh, I hope with many of you. So this is uh, what I wanted to say to, to end up. Thank you all for your participation. Um, I have uh, many, I have got many new ideas now to bridge uh, all those narratives uh, around open education. And I, I leave the floor to Kola. Oh, no. 
no, 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 it's not up to me. I mean, so many people have given brilliant talks. I mean, nothing really to say. Uh, perhaps just sad, yes. I mean, we had this great session also at six o'clock, right, where we tried to recap and, uh, and sort of just say how many people work really hard for this. Um, Open Education Global 2022 is, very, is, is a challenge because 2021 was so good. I mean, so many things happened, so many things were said. We're going to take an enormous amount of time to debrief and to try and sort of make sure that we can reuse all the material that has been shared in these last few days. So I, I really don't know how we're going to do it. I mean, I can see Alan there, so he needs a rest, but I mean, he's only gonna have a few hours, days rest, and then, and then we're gonna to have to use the wonderful work he's done with, uh, with the platform and with others to, to actually sort of try and sort of get hold of all this material. So perhaps if I did have to say a last word, it would be about multilingualism. It, I mean, I have been promoting this for a while and it has come as a surprise to me how valuable it is. It's an enormous um, gain in respect to what we were doing before. Um, I've still got to write a theory about it. You know, sometimes you do the practice, the theory first, and then you practice. In this case, we've tried out, and then you're thinking, wow, this is strong. Um, I've been lucky enough to be able to move from session to session, from an English-speaking session to a Spanish-speaking one or to a French-speaking one. And it's been fascinating to see how the same topics have been addressed by very different people and not at all in the same way. So it can feel as if it was frustrating because you would think, well, why don't we have all these people in the same room? But what happens if you've got everybody in the same room is that you've got one dominating opinion and everybody seems to have to adapt to that opinion. Whereas if you put people with different opinions in different rooms, they are going to develop upon their opinions. A typical um, example is um, South America. The South American perception of openness is just so different, so completely different due to their history, due to the, um, the way the society is organized. And it is so valuable that they actually think independently so now it's up to us to think, OK, now that they've made this huge contribution on their side, how do we integrate it with everything else? So there's a huge challenge out there, but we have sort of discovered something that we didn't have before. And so we really want to uh, we really want to to build upon this. Um, it's a challenge, right? We're, we're miles away from knowing how to do this. But it was fascinating to see the same topics addressed to in French, in English, in Spanish. Sadly, I don't. I'm not. My, my, I, I don't speak Arab nor Chinese, but I'm pretty sure that they will have approached the topics in a completely different way. So, how do we do this in order that open education global is global? And global doesn't mean that horrible word that we call globalization nowadays, which means uniform thinking. It means a variety of thinkings that we manage to somehow put together with each one of these thinkings, um, adding something to it. So anyhow, I've just enjoyed this uh, webinar, the one that I've just been seeing for the last couple of hours. Thank you, Perrine, and thank you all the speakers, and thank you uh, those that have worked hard for this. And yeah, it is a sad moment. It is the moment where somebody has to say goodbye, you know, see you in a few months' time. And yes, please come to Nod. We, we put up some slides to try and explain 10 good reasons to come and tune on. So for those who went there at six o'clock, you can go and have a look at that. Voilà, c'est tout ce que j'avais à dire. Nothing on our ask it here. All right, welcome so, in a few uh, months time. Tu dis quoi? Au revoir à tout le monde. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Good.